Hey guys, Mr. Tota here, and welcome to our very first flipped lesson. Uh, today we're going to be talking about what is science. Uh, by the end of this video, you should know these two objectives. You should be able to state the goals of science, and you should be able to describe the steps used in the scientific method. As you go along, keep a lookout for all these important terms. Uh, if you want to take a screenshot right now, just so you can have the terms on hand to go back to. Uh, write these down in your notes. Make sure you know these terms. If by the end of the video you don't know one of the objectives of the terms, go back and watch it a couple times so you can find it. All right, so we're going to start off by jumping back a couple thousand years to ancient Greece. And we're going to talk about science as a way of knowing. So back then, science wasn't as in-depth and they didn't have the technology they have now. It was up to these guys such as Plato and Aristotle to really give knowledge to the people at the time. Uh, if you see here, Plato is pointing up, thinking about metaphysics, how life happens, lots of thinkings of the, of the brain, and Aristotle here has his hand towards the ground. So he's really talking about things on Earth. Um, and Aristotle is really considered the father of science and, and a modern way of knowing science. Uh, and even until about 100 years ago, a lot of the things that Aristotle thought about or hypothesized about turned out to be true. Um, so really, he's a great father of science and a great person to look to as we think about how we're going to go about knowing science. All right, so the goals of science. Uh, to talk about the goals of science, we're going to use another historical scientist. Hopefully you know him. If not, you will know him by the end of this class, and this is Charles Darwin. And yes, he is famous for the theory of evolution. And we're going to talk a lot about Darwin and his theory of evolution today as we talk about the goals of science and the scientific method. So the first goal of science here is that science is used to provide natural explanations for events in the natural world. Uh, science is not going to provide explanations for things that are unnatural. It provides explanations for things that happen in our world. The second goal of science is it aims to make useful predictions about natural events. Um, so below our picture of Darwin here, we see two different species of Galapagos uh, tortoises here, which Darwin studied when he was in the Galapagos Islands. And they're very closely related, but if you notice, they're different. This guy has a domed shell, and this guy's a saddleback. Uh, much more oval shell. So Darwin's theory of evolution provides a natural explanation. These tortoises were on different islands, so they evolved to their habitat and evolved different shells. Um, so it provides that a natural explanation. The theory of evolution also making will allow us to make useful predictions. So we can say if we have two turtles on an island, they will, over time, evolve into two different species. So on top of these two important goals of science, it's also important to remember that science is always changing and it's always uncertain. We talked about what Aristotle thought thousands of years ago, and while some of the things he hypothesized were true, a lot of the things he thought about were different. For example, he thought about if you had two objects, one which was really big and which was small, and you drop them from the same height, the bigger one would get to the bottom first. We know now that that's not true, that things have terminal velocity, they'll fall at the same rate despite the size. Uh, so that just shows how over time as technology improves and we gain more knowledge, that things about science can change. And it's super important that we remember that as one of the main scientific principles. Um, and pretty much almost every scientific discovery raises more questions than it answers. This here is a black hole. Uh, I'm sure we've heard of them before. And when we started discovering more and more about black holes, particularly when the Hubble telescope was launched, uh, the clear pictures we got about it raised even more questions than answers of what we had. Do things get sucked into it? How much energy are involved with black holes? So while it answered one or two questions, finding out about black holes opened up thousands of more questions. Uh, and again, this is just another example of how science is uncertain, always changing. Now because science is always changing and so uncertain, that's going to mean we need a way to figure out uh, new problems, hypothesize new ideas, 
and answer these unchanging questions. And that's where the scientific method comes about. Okay, and the scientific method is really uh, an idea or a methodology to answering questions which are raised in science. Um, now the scientific method, just like science, is a way of knowing. It's a way of answering these questions uh, in specific steps. So the most important thing about the scientific method is knowing the steps of the scientific method and following those because they allow you to systematically answer a question. So the first step of the scientific method is observing and asking questions. Like I said, we're going to stick with Darwin here and his theory of evolution. Okay. Uh, and really the observing part is that the scientific method starts with making an observation. Okay. You need to notice things that are going on around you. And these are going to lead to questions. So when Darwin was in the Galapagos Islands, he saw all these cute little birds flying around called finches. Um, and what he noticed about the finches is, although they were different colors, their beaks were very different among the birds and between the different islands. Again, these are very closely related species, uh, and the beaks were something that he observed, and this raised a question. How could these birds change and grow these different beaks? If you notice, this guy has got a giant one. This guy's got a small, skinny one. This guy's got a nice, medium-sized one. So there's a lot of diversity. Uh, that Darwin saw within the finches and their beaks. So step one, he observed and he asked a question. How could all these birds have different beaks? Step two, inferring and forming a hypothesis. So an inference is used to create a hypothesis. Two real important terms here, okay? An inference uh, is kind of like background knowledge that you get. So after we make an observation, you're going to look some things up, do some research, uh, and make an inference as to what maybe something is used for, so what the different beaks are used for. Um, after these observations and then getting some knowledge on it and making an inference, we're going to create a hypothesis. So Darwin's hypothesis for these finches is that there was one type of finch that started in the Galapagos Islands, flew over into the Pacific, and from here, this bird evolved on the different islands based on the types of food there. So Darwin's final hypothesis would be that this one bird evolved into different species of birds with different beaks in order to eat different types of food available. So maybe on one island, uh, there was lots of fruit. So we need a nice big beak here to slice through some fruit. Another island, maybe the only thing to eat was grubs. So this descendant of birds was going to evolve long pointy beaks, okay, to poke grubs out of trees. Uh, this, this finch down here, as you can see, learned how to use tools. He could spear grubs and different things with the, with the stick and eat them, okay. So Darwin's hypothesis is going to be that, these, uh, that things can evolve based on needing different resources in different places. Step three, we're going to design a controlled experiment. Okay, so whenever possible, a hypothesis should be tested by an experiment in which only one variable is changed. All right, our classic example, like third grade science fair example, is right here. We can grow plants in poor soil and in good soil, see which one grows better. We're controlling the difference in the experiments. Um, this is called a controlled experiment because you're controlling which variable is changed. Uh, so when we control variables, right, we have two types. We have the independent variable and the dependent variable. And I like this picture down here because it really says it, okay? The independent variable is the one that you change as a researcher, okay? This is going to create a change in something, okay? That change is then going to change the dependent variable. So a great way to remember this is that the dependent variable oops, depends on the independent variable. Okay, so in our third grade flower pot example, the independent variable is the soil. We changed the soil. We have good soil and bad soil. The dependent variable is the flower, right? Is the flower going to grow well, or is it going to grow poorly? Now, it's not always possible to design an experiment, right? If we think of our buddy Darwin here, 
you think it's going to be possible for him to design an experiment to see evolution happen like that? No way. Evolution takes thousands of years, okay? So you don't always have to design an experiment, even though it's proper, right? But what did Darwin do? He made lots and lots and lots of observations. He took field notes, okay? He studied the different birds, studied their diets, studied in many places around the world to kind of build up this case for evolution. Okay, and later on uh, in modern times when we found out about DNA, right, DNA proved, in fact, that Darwin's right about evolution. There was one common ancestor, and we could link all these different finches uh, to this one common finch. Okay, and this brings us into our fourth step, which is collecting and analyzing data. Uh, now, there's two main types of data. There's quantitative and qualitative. Okay, now quantitative uh, refers to data, hard data, such as numbers, um, genetics, right? Anything that we can really trace hard numbers and see physical proof of. Qualitative data is going to be a little bit more subjective, okay? And this is what Darwin used. It's things such as field notes, observations, asking questions to people. The qualitative doesn't have that hard physical number proof, where the quantitative uh, does have that proof. And a great way to think about this uh, is to think of quantitative as being a quantity or amount, and that's the amount of data, physical hard numbers. So quantitative versus qualitative. Okay, so again, uh, we're going to collect and analyze this data uh, to hopefully show us that our hypothesis is either correct or incorrect. Now, when we analyze data, we need to be aware of error, okay? And error is really just a way that we might mess up our experiment. Okay, and there's lots and lots of sources of error. Um, some of them can be the tools we use to collect data. So if you have a broken ruler like this, probably not a great way to measure how tall you're growing, right? All right, and the last step of the scientific method is drawing conclusions. Okay, is your hypothesis supported? Yes or no? Um, and again, it doesn't always have to be supported to get some great answers. Going back to Darwin, drawing a conclusion, yeah, all this evidence he gathered, he had this hypothesis, he observed it to raise that question, he did a lot of observations afterwards to support it instead of an experiment, analyzed the data, and he found out, yes, this theory of evolution really is a thing uh, and explains the diversity of life we see on the Earth. And that's when he came up with the book, Origin of the Species. Um, great book. Read it one day. All right, so when we're drawing conclusions, it's super important to remember that the scientific method is a process, okay? If your hypothesis is not supported, you don't just stop there and call it quits, okay? You go back. So if we look at this schematic here, we have the observation, right? We make a hypothesis. We do the experiment. We observe and analyze data, and hopefully, right, we'll come to a good conclusion. If not, what do we see what to do? Say your experiment goes wrong, right? You observe that data, see what happened, and you go all the way back to the beginning. Start again. Um, maybe something happens with your data analysis, right? You go all the way back again. If in any of these parts your hypothesis isn't supported, maybe you have to tweak it a little bit. Maybe you have to change some of your tools that you're using. Okay, And eventually you're going to find some sort of hypothesis that's either supported or gives you uh, some scientific fact. Okay, uh, So that's it for today, kids. Uh, go back, look at your objectives, look at your key terms, and we're going to go in depth more about this in class.